Well, good morning on this uh, first Sunday in the season of Epiphany. Uh, you know, a powerful metaphor can change the direction of a person's life. Now, just in case you slept through sophomore English and need a review, uh, let me define what a metaphor is. Uh, a metaphor is a figure of speech that describes something in a way that's not literally true, but that still reveals something true. Uh, a measure compares something that we already know about in order to shed light and reveal truth about something we may not know about. So the phrase, he is a wolf, is a metaphor. I don't just mean that he's hungry like a wolf. That would be a simile with just one point of comparison. But if I say he's a wolf, I may mean he's hungry. I may also mean he's dangerous, cunning, violent. He runs with a pack and so on and so forth. Metaphors invite us to find several points of comparison to reveal truth about something we may not know much about. Now, I apologize if this trip back to high school English has triggered some traumatic memories for some of you. I think I saw a few eyes glaze over. But I mention all this because, oh, not the English teachers. <laughs> Uh, I mention all this because the Bible is filled with metaphors about God. If a metaphor compares something that we already know about in order to shed light on something that we don't know much about, it would make sense that God would use metaphors to make himself known to us. And so in the Bible, we find metaphors like God is my fortress, the Lord is my shepherd, God hides me under the shadow of his wings. None of these statements is literally true. God is not made of steel like a fortress is. God doesn't walk around with a literal shepherd's staff. And God doesn't have wings like a bird. But each of these statements reveals something that is true about God by making this comparison. This is how metaphors work. And today we start a new eight-week series in Epiphany called Jesus Revealed. And each week we're going to look at one metaphor that Jesus used to describe himself to other people from the book of John in the Bible. Each metaphor, Jesus begins with the words, I am. And today we're going to start with the metaphor, I am the bread of life from the sixth chapter of the book of John. Now, to understand this first I am statement, this first metaphor, we need to understand how it fits into the book of John in general. As you may know, the Gospel of John is one of four biographies about Jesus found in the Bible. The other three are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and so John makes number four. And John tells the story of Jesus very differently then Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell it. John presents a more topical picture of the life of Jesus rather than the chronological order of story that we find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so while Matthew, Mark, and Luke document Jesus performing dozens and dozens of different miracles, John limits himself to just seven miracles. And John calls these seven miracles signs, and we find them in the first 11 chapters of the book of John. The fourth of these seven signs is found at the very beginning of John chapter 6, the same chapter we find this first I am statement. John's fourth sign is the miracle of Jesus feeding 5,000 people with just five small loaves of barley bread and a few fish. And so the feeding of the 5,000 is a miracle of multiplication. And according to John, after Jesus fed 5,000 people in this miracle of multiplication, the crowd was intent on violently crowning Jesus as their new king. The people were ready to rise up in an armed rebellion against the Roman government and to make Jesus their king. But since Jesus didn't come to lead an armed rebellion against Rome, John tells us that he slipped away out of the crowd. That fourth sign sets the scene for our first I am statement. In John chapter 6, beginning in verse 26. 
says this. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you were looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man, that's Jesus, the way of describing himself, the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked Jesus, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one God has sent. So they asked Jesus, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, that is, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So after the crowd finally finds Jesus, after he slips out of the crowd when they try to make him the king, he questions whether they are seeking him for the right reasons. You see, they were looking for Jesus because he fed them, not because they wanted to know who he was or what he stood for. And Jesus warns them not to labor, not to work for food that spoils, but to work for food that is going to result in eternal life. Now, Jesus is using work as a metaphor here. That just as we go to our job in order to earn money and buy groceries so we can eat each day, we should put that same kind of effort into our spiritual lives in order to have eternal life. Now, in the Bible, eternal life is not merely going to heaven after we die. I mean, eternal life includes that. But at its core in the Bible, eternal life is a right relationship with God in the here and the now. Eternal life involves God removing the barrier of sin that keeps us from a relationship with God. And once that barrier of sin is removed, we are reconciled to God, which creates an ongoing relationship with the God who created us. That's eternal life in the Bible. And Jesus is saying to the people that he fed bread to that eternal life is even more important than eating food. The, the crowd asked Jesus, since he's talking about work, what kind of work he's talking about. What works does God require for them? But they don't quite understand that Jesus is using a metaphor here. That he's not talking about literal work and literal food. He's talking about a relationship with God in the here and now. What they really want to know is what kind of work they need to do in order to get the kind of food Jesus fed them with when he fed the 5,000. Jesus' answer in verse 29 is that there is no work that they can do. The only thing that they can do is believe in Jesus. Faith in Jesus is the only, quote, work that will result in eternal life. Jesus is inviting them to trust him, to believe in him, to become his follower, his disciple. The people don't like his answer. So instead of believing in him, they ask Jesus for yet another sign. And then they'll believe in him, they say. And they remind Jesus that in the Old Testament, God provided the people of God with manna, bread from heaven, each day. The Old Testament calls this bread manna. And for 40 years, God gave the people of Israel manna, six days a week, every day except the Sabbath day. So seizing on this metaphor... Jesus says that he is the bread that God is now offering them. That he has come down from heaven to give life to the whole world. 
The people ask Jesus to give them this bread from heaven, still not quite understanding that he's speaking in a metaphor here. And in verse 35 is where we find the first I am statement in the book of John. I am the bread of life. Jesus is the manna from heaven, the bread of God that has come into our world to give life to the whole world. With this metaphor, Jesus is comparing something they all know about, bread, in order to shed light on something they don't know about, Jesus. In the ancient world, bread was served with every single meal. They, they didn't know anything about um, gluten um, allergies or celiac uh, disease back then. Bread was so prevalent that no matter what was contained in a meal, it was called sharing bread. And just as bread provides people with physical sustenance and nourishment at every meal, Jesus is saying that he is the sustenance, the nourishment that results in eternal life, a relationship with God. Now let's skip down to verse 51 through 58. In case they missed it the first time, in verse 51 he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. But then he starts pushing this metaphor. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus keeps pushing this metaphor until it starts making the people extremely uncomfortable. Until finally in verse 52, some people that John calls the Jews start to object. Now in John's gospel, this phrase, the Jews, always refers to the Jewish religious leaders. It's not talking about all Jewish people everywhere, but the religious leaders. And these religious leaders start to push back against Jesus' teaching because what he's saying is starting to sound a lot like cannibalism. But Jesus keeps pushing. In fact, he adds drinking his blood to this metaphor. That unless they eat his flesh and drink his blood, they will be cut off from the eternal life that God is offering through Jesus, the bread of life. Well, by now, it's not just the religious leaders who are offended. Skip down to verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Now it's his own disciples. Those who've come out of the crowd and trusted Jesus and committed to living by his teaching and adopting his way of life, now they're struggling too. Jesus has pressed this metaphor so far that even those who've trusted in him are confused and are starting to question their decision to follow Jesus. Now, in verse 63, Jesus clarifies that he's speaking in metaphors here. He's not talking about literally eating flesh or drinking blood, but his metaphor is so shocking that everyone is offended. This first I am statement 
is simply too much for most people. Skip down to verse 66 through 69. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed Jesus. You do not want to leave too, Jesus asked the twelve, the apostles. Simon Peter answered Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. His own disciples walked away. Only the twelve apostles remained. Earlier in this chapter, chapter more than 5,000 people were ready to lead an armed rebellion against the Roman government in order to violently crown Jesus as their king. And by the end of the chapter, nearly all of those people have walked away from Jesus, leaving just the 12 apostles. All because of a metaphor. That's how powerful a metaphor can be. It can change the direction of a person's life. Now, there's so much we could talk about in this chapter if we had hours and hours, but we don't. So I just want to focus on three things. Three, let's call them epiphanies, three surprising insights that we gain from this first I am statement. Here's the first epiphany. Our deepest hungers point to our need for God. Our deepest hungers in life point to our need for God. Jesus saw our daily hunger for food as a metaphor for the deepest hungers we have in life. It's like that famous theologian Bruce Springsteen, the boss, says, everybody's got a hungry heart. A couple of years ago, I read a book called The Holy Longing by an author named Ron Rollheiser. And Rollheiser begins his book by saying this. He says, we are not restful creatures who sometimes get restless. We are not fulfilled people who sometimes are dissatisfied. Rather, we are restless people who occasionally find rest, dissatisfied people who only occasionally find fulfillment. And Rollheiser is saying that part of the human condition for everyone includes deep inner hungers that are never fully satisfied. We hunger for significance. Everyone wants to know why they're alive, what their purpose in life is. I mean, is it to, to get a job and make a lot of money and, and save for retirement and retire and buy an RV and travel around? Is it to soak up every experience that I can? Why am I here? We're hungry for identity. We want to know who we are. We wonder, am I defined by my job or my family, my nationality, my race, my citizenship, my political party? Am I defined by who I love? Am I defined by how many Instagram likes I get? Who defines my identity? We hunger for healing, for justice, to be loved. Rollheiser says that how a person tries to satisfy these deep inner hungers is that person's spirituality, whether they're a religious person or not. Their spirituality is what they do to try to satisfy these inner longings. What are your deepest hungers? Maybe it's a hunger for significance or identity. Or maybe you hunger for justice, for what's wrong in life to be made right. Maybe you hunger to be loved, be accepted. Whether you're a religious person or not, whether you consider yourself a Christian or not, these deep hungers are pointing you to God. By using hunger as a metaphor, Jesus revealed that our deepest hungers point us to God. Here's a second epiphany from the, this first I am statement. Jesus does the work necessary to satisfy these hungers. Jesus does the work necessary. See, when we experience these deep inner hungers, we look for something to do, some, some way that we can satisfy our inner hungers because that's how the world works. With physical food, if you don't work, you don't eat. 
And so it makes sense that it's up to us to find a way to satisfy these deep inner hungers. And so we turn to created things to try to fill these inner hungers. We turn to our family or to our marriage. Sometimes we turn to addictions, to adrenaline, to our Amazon wish list, hoping that these things will, will satisfy our inner hungers, and they do for a minute or two. But none last for very long because created things were never designed to satisfy our deepest hungers. It's like the French mathematician Blaise Pascal said, he called this inner hunger a God-shaped vacuum that only the presence of God can fill. The only work that we can do to satiate these inner hungers are to believe in Jesus. This is the work of God, and, and work in quotes, because faith isn't even really a work. Jesus came to give his life for the life of the world. He has done the work. He is the living bread, the manna from heaven, and he gives himself as a gift. And since it's a gift, we can't buy it, we can't earn it. All we can do is receive it by faith. This is really what becoming a Christian is. It's abandoning our own efforts to satisfy our deepest hungers and turning in faith to Jesus, believing that he has done the work to fill the deepest hungers of our lives. Finally, there's a third epiphany I think we find in this first I am statement, and it's this. We must continue to be nourished by Jesus to sustain our spiritual life. We need the continual nourishment that comes from Jesus to sustain our spiritual lives. See, the thing about hunger is no matter how hungry you are, when you eat, you're going to be hungry again in a couple hours, in 12 hours, the next day. When we come to faith in Jesus for him to meet our deepest hungers, he gives us eternal life. He's done the work necessary. But then we need the continual nourishment that comes from him in order to sustain the life of faith that we have started when we believed in him. You know, it's always puzzled Bible teachers that the book of John never mentions Jesus instituting communion. Communion, also called the Lord's Supper, is one of the two sacraments of the Christian church, the other one, baptism. And in Christian theology, a, a sacrament is a visible sign of an invisible grace. And so in the case of communion, the visible sign is the bread and the cup of communion and the invisible grace that that sign signifies are all of the promises that God has made to us through Jesus, his Son, now, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all describe at the Last Supper, before Jesus died, Jesus instituting the sacrament of communion with his followers. But John doesn't. John describes the Last Supper, but never mentions communion. And I suspect the reason why John doesn't mention communion there is because of his account of Jesus' teaching here in John chapter 6. See, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say that, that at the Last Supper, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, he broke the bread, and then he gave them the bread and said, this bread is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And then after the meal, he took the cup of wine, he blessed it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this wine is my blood, which is shed for you. Take and drink in remembrance of me. Jesus was using metaphors. The metaphor of, of the bread is a metaphor for his body. The cup is a metaphor for his blood. It's hard not to see the connection between those words in Matthew, Mark, and Luke and what Jesus says here in verses 51 through 58. See, I believe that verses 51 and 58 of this section are pointing us to communion. We experience the presence of Jesus in a unique way when we eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord's Supper. 
As we eat and drink, we not only express our faith in Jesus, but God does a work that nourishes, confirms, and strengthens that faith that we have when we eat and drink in faith. This is the Reformed view of communion. Jesus is truly present to us in a unique way during the sacrament of communion and God strengthens and ratifies and confirms our faith in him when we eat and drink. Now, why am I making a big deal about this now? Well, in verse 56 of the section that I read, Jesus said this, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. That word remain is an important one in John's gospel. It occurs 40 different times in the book of John. It means to make yourself at home somewhere or to stay in a relationship with someone. In John chapter 8 verse 31, Jesus will say that remaining in his teaching is how we show ourselves to be his disciples. In chapter 15 of John, Jesus will say that unless his word remains in us and we remain in him, we're not going to be fruitful as Christians, that we need to remain in him. And one way we remain is through his word, his teaching, reading and listening and studying the Bible, the teachings of Jesus. And <clears throat> as Christians, we talk a lot about remaining in the word. But here in verse 56 of John chapter 6, we learn that we also remain in Jesus and he remains in us through the sacrament of communion. We stay with Jesus making ourselves at home with Jesus. And he stays with us, making himself at home in us as we share the bread and the cup of the Lord's Supper together in our worship as a church. To sustain our spiritual life, we need the continual nourishment that comes from the Lord's Supper. Communion is one of the primary ways that Jesus has given us to sustain our spiritual lives over a lifetime. It's not the only way, but it's an essential way. If we starve ourselves from the nourishment that Jesus offers, isolating ourselves from the people of God, it shouldn't surprise us when our faith grows weak. And our spiritual life begins to falter. The sacraments are an essential part of our worship together because they nourish us in the faith. Metaphors can change the direction of a person's life. Jesus used a metaphor in John chapter 6 that led many people to walk away from him. But for those who understood the metaphor, he revealed some unexpected epiphanies, insights about himself. That our deepest hungers point us to our need for God. That Jesus has done all the work necessary to satisfy these hungers. And that we need to continually be nourished by Jesus to sustain our spiritual lives over the long haul. You know, when you're hungry, all you can think about is eating. Some of you are thinking about lunch right now and you haven't heard a word that I said because your stomachs are growling. <laughs> but you know, if you're hungry for a long time, eventually the hunger pangs start to go away. And over time, people who are malnourished or who are starving become less and less aware of their hunger. I can't help but wonder how many people have ignored their deepest longings for so long that they barely feel the pangs of those inner hungers anymore. How many of us are so starved for the bread of life that gives life to the world that, that the hunger pains have faded? My prayer is that when we come to worship together, that we are aware of those deepest hungers and we expectantly come ready to meet Jesus, the living bread, the bread of God, that he might nourish and sustain our hungry souls. Let's pray.
Father, thank you for these words that were so difficult for those who first heard them to receive and understand. Lord, words that people found offensive and yet Jesus said, give life. God, may we be a congregation that is aware of our deepest hungers. And may we come to worship you, not ignoring those deep longings, but bringing them with us. Our hunger for healing, for justice, for significance, for identity. The deepest longings of our hearts. And may we be nourished by you through the word and through the sacrament, through prayer and through music, through being with one another, that we might be nourished to live this life for the long haul. For we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.